Hello, my name is Alexander Solozhin. I am an RA here at the Institute of European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at Carleton University. For our War Observatory project, we're conducting a series of interviews with experts in various academic fields relevant to the war that Russia is waging in Ukraine. In this series, we cover basic and advanced subject matters relevant to the war. We intend for these vid videos to be used as teaching materials for faculty and students in Canada and around the world. Joining me here today to answer a few questions regarding the European Union's role in the war in Ukraine is Dr. Joan de Barleben. Uh, Dr. Barleben is Chancellor's Professor here at the Institute of European, Russian and Eurasian Studies. Her academic interests include the European Union and Russia, the EU's European neighborhood policy and Eastern partnership, politics and and society in the Soviet successor states, especially Russia, federalism and multi-level governance in Europe and Russia, Russian elections and Russian federalism. Her current research projects include the EU and Ukraine crisis, causes and consequence, and Russian federalism and elections in Russia. So as a supranational organization, the EU is host to a large variety of nations, each with their own distinct histories and, and politics. How has the perspective on this war differed in various EU states, uh, especially as this concerns the Western and Eastern uh, states of the EU? Okay, so I think we can say that on the one hand, there's been a remarkable degree of unanimity among the EU member states in, in reaction, not only to this current war, which is going on in Russia's aggressions against Ukraine in, in the year of 2022 that we're seeing, but also going back to 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea. And so we need to keep that kind of fully in view, even as we're looking at some of the differences between member states. And the indicator of that unanimity is that the member states of the European Union have continued to provide unanimous support for sanctions against Russia throughout that entire period. So from 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea, up until the beginning of the of the, the new the war in 2022, the sanctions remained in place, and that required through that whole period unanimous agreement of the member states. You know, before Britain left with Brexit, the and then after that, the 27 member states, and since the war has begun, the new sanctions, which are you know remarkably strong and and costly really for Western countries and for the member states of the EU have also gotten unanimous support in most regards with some issues recently that they'll talk about in a minute. And that is really astounding in some ways. I, I think many people might not have expected that. So that having been said, of course, it's not quite that simple. This all has required some hard work. Um, and the fundamental reason is that most foreign policy decisions require this unanimous agreement. And the reason for this is that many countries are reluctant to give over their sovereignty in this area. There is also a lot of member state sovereignty in certain aspects of energy policy, which is an important part of, of the relationship with, with Russia, particularly in terms of energy mix. In other words, where member states get their energy from, whether it's nuclear, whether it's natural gas, whether it's you know, wind energy. And so it's very, um, in these particular areas, especially foreign policy, it's important to be able to get that unanimity. And so this is, has been, been a challenge. Now, I think there are three reasons why member states differ in terms of their attitudes toward issues like this in relation to the countries to the east, whether it be Russia or Ukraine. One is history. A second is the degree of energy dependence. And the third are other economic ties. And so we'll just start kind of um, you know, looking before, let's say, 2022 when the war started, or even before 2014 when the Crimean annexation occurred. You could kind of roughly look at different camps of countries in their attitudes toward Russia and maybe to the Eastern neighborhood as well, but Russia really being the much more contentious issue here because it's a big country, an important neighbor. The countries that have been the most skeptical of Russia and Russia's motives are those countries that 
previously were under Russian subjugation. And particularly the three Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, as well as Poland. And of course, Sweden and Finland, not being members of NATO, of course, now they're kind of on a track to become members of NATO, um, also maintained, although they maintained a traditional kind of, I wouldn't call exactly neutral, but uh, less, um, how to put it, neutral in the sense of not being a member of NATO, um, they have, Sweden has traditionally also had all, or recently a little bit more skeptical attitude toward Russia as well because of its commitment to a very strong values agenda. Then there's another group of countries that have had very strong economic ties with Russia in particular, and that would include Germany. And of course, Germany has other historical connections with Russia, going back to the division of Germany and the fact that, that the Soviet Union kind of allowed the German reunification. And also France has very strong ties with, um, with Russia, economic ties. And so, of course, economic interests can be very, very important in shaping how one views a relationship with a country. So maybe a bit more willingness to engage with Russia in, in ways that would be, you know, not reflect such a high degree of skepticism as some of the countries in the Baltic states and Poland. Finally, there are some countries that have had, had stronger ties with Russia. And this would include countries like uh, Bulgaria, which has had strong energy relations, Hungary, um, to a certain extent, Austria, Greece, and Italy. And then yet another set of countries like Spain and Portugal for which Russia in the East is not so important. It's quite far away geographically. So you can see this kind of diversity of interests that um, are present. So when we talk, I'll just go back to those three kind of factors then, which are history, energy, and economics. On energy, this has been an area where it's been somewhat harder to gain unanimity in terms of an EU policy position. And we have seen this recently as the EU has been considering the possibility of an embargo on imports of oil and natural gas. And here, this would be very costly for all the member states. Most member states have been willing to get on board with this despite some reluctance and despite the difficulty of actually implementing it. For example, Germany, which canceled an important pipeline project, the Nord Stream project with Russia, and which recently has committed itself to weaning itself off of dependence on Russian energy. But other countries, particularly Hungary, has been much more reluctant and in fact has not really agreed very easily to this kind of an approach. So this policy has had to have exceptions built into it to allow some countries to continue importing these products for a longer period of time than other countries in the EU would. Uh, so you, you know, when you think about energy, the Baltic states have traditionally also been very dependent on Russia for energy, and yet they're very russophobic. And why is that? Because of history. So here's where history kicks in. Countries that have, been, have felt themselves subjugated to Russian influence in the past have generally been much more skeptical of uh, Russian motives. And this translates to a certain extent into stronger and more assertive support for Ukraine because Ukraine of course is under attack by Russia. So the Baltic states, Poland, have been very strong in their support for Ukraine and have long been pushing for closer and closer relations with Ukraine and the possibility of a membership perspective. Countries like Germany and France have come around to that position since, since February, 2022. And of course, more recently, we've seen that the EU has affirmed Ukraine's role position as a candidate, EU candidate member, candidate state, which is a really big shift. And this really, it's amazing, has gotten unanimous agreement again from all of the member states, at least in a preliminary way. It doesn't mean that Ukraine's now a member. It means they're, they're given a prospect of being a member, which they never had before until just you know, very recently. So we see a kind of mix of tension, of differences in viewpoint on the one hand, 
But a lot of unanimity, on the other hand, which I think is really triggered by just the, the kind of um, atrocities that have been committed against Ukraine in this, in this most recent time period when Russia you know, invaded Ukraine and tried, has tried to take over significant portions of the country. And so uh, speaking of uh, potential membership in the, in the EU, um, I think at the, at the very start of the war, there were discussions for um, fast tracking Ukraine to membership. And today, some of the leaders um, of uh, European states are more cautious about Ukraine's accessions, accession, uh, suggesting that it may take longer than a decade. So how does the EU regard Ukraine's prospect, uh, prospects at EU uh, membership and which, which EU states are more cautious and which are more optimistic? Yeah, well, of course, major developments occurred um, in this regard just this month in June of 2022, when the European, when Ukraine, previously, Ukraine, recently Ukraine applied for, for admission to the EU, as did uh, Moldova and Georgia, which are countries that are, have been actively um, pursuing closer relations through the Eastern Partnership policy of the European Union. And just recently then, the European Union has unanimously, both the Commission recommendation and the European Council, which represents the leaders of the various EU countries, have agreed to make Ukraine and Moldova both candidate states for EU membership. And one can't emphasize enough how radical and important this is. Now, it doesn't mean that Ukraine or Moldova are going to be members very soon because it's a long, long road to get from being a candidate to being an actual member. But it has very great importance in terms of symbolic value and in terms of motivation for Ukraine in terms of its, its various reform processes, which it will be taking up again, I'm sure quite assertively once the war ends. Um, Ukraine has long felt frustrated by the fact that the EU expected it to implement certain kinds of political and economic form, reforms, but was not willing to grant a prospect for membership. But being a candidate state means that, that Ukraine is definitely on the track toward membership in the European Union. Now, how long can this take? It can take a long time. Um, some people would say you know, a few years, others would say a few decades. So if we look at other countries that are trying to gain membership that are candidate states, we see it can be a long time. Serbia has been a candidate state since 2012, and it's expected that maybe in 2025 it, that aspiration could be realized. We have others like Turkey, which has been a candidate state from, since 1999, and most people consider it will probably not become a membership member um, at any time in the foreseeable future. So we, we are looking at presumably quite a long time period because there are a lot of reforms that have to be undertaken. And these fall into the category of political reforms, um, improving implementation of rule of law, um, overcoming corruption. And on the other hand, economic reforms, eventually Ukraine will have to adopt the whole body of EU legislation. And although they've been working on this in connection with the association agreement that they signed with the EU in 2014, um, this is bound to be a long process. But the fact that all of the member states have affirmed that eventual you know, possibility of accession to the EU is very, very significant. Now, as I mentioned before, there are some you know, variations in the degree of enthusiasm for this. And the most enthusiastic countries, again, are the Baltic states, Poland, um, probably, you know, the, as you move further to the, to the West, the enthusiasm may wane a little bit, but Germany and France definitely as the strongest, largest member states on board with this kind of an approach. Um, I, I don't think that that is likely to change. I mean, I think there will be a progression toward membership on the part of Ukraine. And that if it really is, you know, to a significant degree up to Ukraine to be able to fulfill the conditions. Now, of course, the war has to end as long as the countries have war uh, membership 
is unlikely to be a, an immediate prospect. There has been, however, some, there was, however, some dissension when this decision about, about EU candidate stat status for Ukraine was adopted. And some of it had to do with the fact that it, it looked a bit like Ukraine was leapfrogging over some of those other countries which had been waiting in line to become members. And some member states, particularly Bulgaria, raised some concerns about that and tried to use this as an opportunity to push forward. Um, uh, well, not so much Bulgaria pushing, pushing forward because Bulgaria had actually been more or less blocking Albania and Northern Macedonia for membership, but Austria pressing for Bosnia-Herzegovina to be pushed forward in its, in its aspiration for candidate status. So we did see some dissension there over the West Balkans with some criticism of Bulgaria for holding back Albania and North Macedonia and Austria pushing on the other hand for quicker action on some of the other West Balkan states. Now these are very complex uh, political negotiations in the case of Bulgaria, it has to do with you know, historical issues relating to Macedonia. And in the case of um, other member states, it may have to do just with you know, similar kinds of historical ties or geographical proximity. So it, there's always a bargaining process is the point. But I would still expect that Ukraine now having been given candidate status would be on a pretty clear progression toward membership, even though it may take quite a long time. Thank you so much for taking my questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you.